This notion that human culture just started with dynastic Egypt, I think is just, um, in my opinion, complete nonsense. And what's so odd about this is that some of the most impressive vessels, in terms of the accuracy and the precision, are acknowledged to come from a time before dynastic Egypt. This is, a, this is according to mainstream thought, mainstream archaeologists and Egyptologists. And in general, the less impressive vessels are typically more recent. So this one's from the Middle, the middle Kingdom and the Middle Dynasty, like 14, 1400 BC circa. It's pottery painted to look like stone. Okay, and the explanation here, you can probably, maybe you can see it, it's, it's amazing. This, this is a high priest. He was too poor for stone. Okay, right. So in other words, no one knew how to make them anymore, I think was what you can read into that. Uh, much of what's known in academia is really based on an incomplete data set. Stone can vary a lot. Um, we have this thing called the Mohs scale, which is really describing the hardness of minerals, not stone. Uh, but stone's made up of minerals, so you can take a typical composition of what, say, granite or diorite is, and then get kind of like a range. And so all this is saying is like a six can cut a five, but not a seven. So it's a relative scale. Uh, and then we see the difference between some of the, the more popular stones on the right. The difference between diorite and granite, because they're easily confused, is diorite just lacks quartz effectively. It's usually a little bit softer. Um, now note that sandstone, which is right here, is about a six or a seven that was used by the dynastics. It is hard stone, but it is a lot easier to cut and work. We just don't see it in vessels. And note down here, corundum, it's one of the hardest minerals just under diamond. In terms of absolute hardness, now this is not relative, so as you can see, a diamond is like 15 times harder than quartz and four times harder than corundum. Quartz will cut almost anything except for the stuff above it. Here are some granite vessels. Uh, a lot of these we've examined and some porphyry. So porphyry usually contains these giant crystals, crystal inclusions as some people call them. They're typically feldspar, which is a little bit softer than quartz, but just about as hard. Um, it's made up of all different types of, uh, excuse me, it's made up of all different types of minerals, so the hardness of different types of porphyry can vary actually quite a bit. Here's some more, this is from the British Museum. This is kind of a famous picture. Um, and then trachyte porphyry is rare in most of the world, but it does happen to come from Mount Kilimanjaro the highest mountain in Africa, so I think we're comfortable that we know where this comes from. A lot of the porphyry vessels that we've examined, us, at least in terms of like the analysis that we've done, are not ultra precise, but they're very impressive nonetheless. One of the reasons I like them a lot, they're, they're pretty, obviously, but if you look at these crystals, these giant crystals, they're a much different hardness than the ground mass, the material that's interspersed in the actual body, but they're cut to the same degree and the same shape. So I think that's highly impressive, difficult work, regardless of the fact that the accuracy might not be as high as some of the granites. Uh, Johanna actually mentioned this yesterday in her presentation on India, like very similar concept. More porphyry vessels here. So some have these gold handles. I strongly suspect these were added much later, maybe by the dynastics themselves. Why? Um, well, it appears that the holes were added later. Let's see if you guys can see this. Um, I don't know if you can see, but if you look at the right hole versus the left hole, the drill holes don't align, they're like disjoint, right? So that's a far inferior type of workmanship than, went into, than what went into the actual vessel body itself. Uh, some of these have lug handles with no holes at all. So I, I believe they, they were probably added later. This is Nice, a type of diorite. Um, this is a lighter version of it. It's actually harder than the darker version because of the mineral content. So even within the same family, stone can vary quite a bit. Another nice bowl, this is beautiful. These are diorite vessels. And then gray whack. So gray whack is a sedimentary stone. It's like siltstone, grayish green. It's, it's stunning in statue form. We don't really see too many bowls or vessels, although there are some. Uh, but this is Tutmosis, allegedly, and uh, Mankari, I think. And the middle statue you'll see in the Luxor Museum, usually there's a crowd of tourists just kind of standing around it like gawking. And I've done that and been there. So I don't really know who made these or when, and I'm not actually suggesting that these are made to the same level of precision or accuracy as the vessels. I think, in fact, they might not be, but they do seem to display some, um, some pretty good qualities of, of, uh, of precision nonetheless, and they would have been cut with some type of machinery or technology. Schist and siltstone, breccia. Breccia is just a Roman word for rubble, and it's a heterogeneous material, so again, it would have been difficult to cut in shape like this, even if it's not quite as hard as the quartz-based rocks. This is basalt. It's a black volcanic stone. And serpentine, which is a metamorphic rock, this has got this greenish hue. It's also quite nice to look at. It's about a six, roughly, on the, on the most scale. So hard to cut. 
So the story here, and the reason I'm kind of focused on these things and what convinced me initially, I heard some of this information over time, um, really has like three components to it. One is there's tons of these things. 40,000 alone were found under the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara. Many thousands more were found in pre-dynastic Nakata, Nubia, and elsewhere by archaeologists. Two, dynastic Egyptians. Dynastic Egyptians collected these things, just like our archaeologists do today, from earlier burials and tombs. It's, they're considered pre-dynastic by academia, so this is not really disputed. Uh, dynastic Egyptians, I don't, at least in my opinion, and I don't think anything supports that they had the knowledge or the tools to actually make these themselves. And then lastly, Egyptologists claim these were made by hand with primitive tools. The time to make one stone vessel is, is estimated in years, plural. So there's something, I think, profound about this story. This is a big story that has largely been ignored. 